My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the evening services for Sunday, uh, let's see, February, March, April the 2nd. We will sing several songs, we'll observe the Lord's Supper, and I have a message that hopefully will be enlightening to all of us. We are singing from our songs, Songs of Faith and Praise, and we will give you the name of the song and the number, just in case you don't have that song and you want to Google it or you have a different book, you can sing along with us. So the first song that we are going to sing in our book is number 202. The title is Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. 202, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee. By the way, you might notice if you had the book, music, if you wonder why it's so pretty, is by Beethoven. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before me, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. All thy works with joy surround me, earth and heaven reflect thy rays. Stars and angels sing around the center of unbroken praise. Field and forest, vale and mountains, flowery meadow, flashing sea. Chanting bird and flowing fountain, call us to rejoice in thee. Thou art giving and forgiving, ever blessing, ever blessed. Wellspring of the joy of living, ocean depth of happy rest. Thou our Father, Christ our Brother, all who live in love are thine. Teach us how to love each other, lift us to the joy divine. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love blinds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. Number 116, 116, the title is God Will Make a Way. 116, God Will Make a Way. <clears throat> God will make a way where there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. He will be my guide. Hold me closely to his side. With love and strength for each new day. He will make a way, he will make a way. And before we observe the Lord's Supper, turn to number 705. The title is A Common Love. 705, A Common Love. <clears throat> Oh, 
A common love for each other, a common gift to the Savior, a common bond holding us to the Lord. A common strength when we're weary, a common hope for tomorrow, a common joy in the truth of God's Word. We come to the time in the service that we observe uh, the Lord's Supper. We are instructed to do this in our New Testaments. We are instructed to do it on the Lord's Day, which is Sunday, on the first day of the week, according to the seventh verse of the 20th chapter of the book of Acts. Uh, it is recorded for us that in the night that Jesus was betrayed, uh, he met with his disciples around the Passover season. He broke bread with them and he let them know uh, the symbology of his body and his blood. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul for the Corinthians shows them almost exactly the same thing as he, uh, as he extols of the virtues of Jesus Christ in that uh, he not only came into the world, but he came into the world knowing that he would be sacrificed for the sins of the world. So we, as we gather around the table, help us to understand that Jesus was the one-time sacrifice forever. He was uh, the replacement of the old covenant in that sacrifices of that sort would not be made anymore. This does not mean we should not live sacrificial lives, but Jesus made the perfect sacrifice once and for all. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful that Jesus was willing to die upon the cross. We understand the agony that he was in, the, the separateness from his Father, and that while he hung on that cross, uh, the sins of the world, uh, when he uh, sacrificed himself, could be forgiven. We're just so thankful that Jesus was willing to give up his body for us. As we partake of the bread, let's remember that. We pray it in his most holy name. Amen. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We understand, dear Heavenly Father, the power of the blood, the life-giving blood that was, is within each of us. That Jesus willingly shed his blood, and that blood is uh, there eternally for the forgiveness of our sins. Help us to to realize and understand the significance of this sacrifice every time we drink of the fruit of the vine, that his blood was shed for each one of us. We pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The Lord's Supper being completed, also, on the first day of the week, we are instructed according to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, the first two verses, that we lay by in store that which, we, that which we have prospered, and we give it back to the Lord. The church is a giving institution. The church is an institution that's interested not only in evangelizing the world, but helping others to evangelize the world and helping those that are in need. We just pray that the monies that are given will be used in a just manner so that more people will come to the Lord and more people that are in need uh, uh, will have that need fulfilled because of the benevolence of the people of this church. Let's pray as we give. We know from the scriptures, dear Heavenly Father, that you love a cheerful giver. 
we just pray that we will give with an open heart with the, and with an open wallet that uh, we will give as we have prospered and understand that we have prospered so much more sometimes than we think we have. Help us to give knowing that the monies will be used uh, to further your work. Bless us in our giving. Help us to have giving hearts and giving souls. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. The last song we'll sing is number 578. It is called, We Will Glorify. 578, We Will Glorify. <clears throat> we will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty, we will bow before His throne. We will worship Him in righteousness, we will worship Him alone. He is Lord of heaven, Lord of earth. He is Lord of all who live. He is Lord above the universe. All praise to Him we give. Hallelujah to the King of kings. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Hallelujah to the Lord of Lords, who is the great I Am. We truly enjoyed singing with you. I hope you enjoyed the song service as much as we did. And know the Lord was praised in our song because he is worthy of that praise and we should praise him uh, as often as we possibly can. This evening, if uh, you were there for the AM service, you know that the um, title of the lesson this evening was very, very, very simple. The title of the lesson is SALT, S-A-L-T, SALT. If you're a science person, it is a combination of sodium and chlorine. Uh, it is called sodium chloride or N-A-C-L, but it has a lot of significance in the history of man, and in particular for us as Christians. Uh, sometimes things uh, to us, and by the way, it's still one of the cheapest things that you can buy at your store. Uh, some of the simplest things um, are of the greatest value, and indeed they have valuable lessons for us. One of the traits that made Jesus so great is that he was the master teacher. He could put things in perspective for us and simplify them to the point where he used simple things to get his point across. Branches and vine dressers. He, he taught lessons of forgiveness in the parables. He talked about what the kingdom of God is all about. But when Jesus finished the Beatitudes in the fifth chapter of Matthew, uh, verses 3 through 12, which describe supposedly the character of his people, he immediately turned to what influence his people were to have on the peoples of the earth. And he characterized them in two different ways. He said, the, we are to be like salt and we are to be like light. Now, we're going to focus on salt this evening. It is said, according to the National Geographic, September 1977, quote, during the winter of Napoleon's retreat from Moscow, salt starvation decimated his troops lowering resistance to disease. Epidemic spread, wounds that might otherwise have healed became fatal, 
thousands died. Hmm. Salt is very valuable uh, in many aspects of our life. It's no wonder that Jesus said and put it in these simplistic terms, you are the salt of the earth, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Now understand, when Jesus said this, and he was speaking mostly to a Jewish audience, the people, the Jews, probably, no, they undoubtedly knew what salt was all about. The idea of salt came through their mind if they had a knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures. So one of the first things that I would like to draw upon this evening is that salt declares one's loyalty. Very often in biblical times, when transactions were made and when a covenant between individuals was sealed, it was sealed by eating salt. How do I know this? Well, it was called a covenant of salt. And if you are listening and, and you want to uh, be a Berean and you, you want to research this, here are the three scriptures. Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Leviticus 2, 13. Numbers chapter 18 and verse 19. And Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. It says, and it's kind of interesting, that Abijah said to Jeroboam, this was when a covenant was made, the Lord God of Israel gave rule over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt. Hmm. So at least from a symbolic standpoint, God and, and David entered a covenant which was sealed by salt. And what that did is it declared David's loyalty not only to God, but that his descendants would rule his people, Christ as a descendant of David, is still ruling over God's people. And it began very simply in that covenant, that covenant of salt. Now in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 and 4, we understand that when one is baptized into Christ, he makes, or he or she makes a covenant with God. So when Jesus said that we are the salt of the earth, it is to remind us that we have entered into a covenant with God. It was a serious covenant back then. It's still a serious covenant today. When we are baptized into the Lord, the Lord expects us to keep up our part of the bargain, to keep up our part of the covenant. Our, our declaration is one of loyalty. It is declared as we confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. How seriously do we look at Christ's commands? Because we are the salt of the earth, we need to be reminded that we are to be loyal to Christ, no matter what the cost. Second on my list is salt reminds us of sacrifice. In all ancient cultures, salt was valuable. And often it was thought of, of as a connection, even in the heathen world. Even in the Greek world, Homer spoke of salt as being divine. Plato hailed it as a substance dear to the gods. Even these mythical gods that Homer and Plato were talking about, salt was divine. It was a substance dear to those gods. 
Remember I told us, I told you about Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. Here are those words. Every grain offering of yours, moreover, you shall season with salt, so that the salt of the covenant, the salt of the covenant of your God shall not be lacking from your grain offerings. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. Again, think of Jesus' words. We are the salt of the earth. We're reminded of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that we just celebrated when we observed the Lord's Supper. And so in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, Paul writes those famous words, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Third on my list is that salt is essential to life. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 4, we find out that when babies were born, they were bathed in water and then rubbed with salt. Now, you know what? It was into the probably late 1800s, early 1900s, that uh, humans, the, the medical field, understood what antiseptics were all about that are very, very commonplace today. But salt, even the ancients understood, was a preventative. It was used to prevent disease. Without salt, our physical bodies were prone to convulsions, uh, to paralysis, even death. When athletes work out, they use these salt-based substances that are called electrolytes. And it's very important to replace those electrolytes back into our bodies. We're familiar with the idea uh, before refrigeration, that uh, when people would make long treks, uh, they would take the meat and heavily dose it down with salt. The salt preserved the meat and kept it from rotting. And it preserved those people so that they could eat the meat. Now, of course, let's be mindful, uh, those of us that are salt addicts, we know that too much salt is not good for us. It's not good for blood pressure. It's certainly not good for people with heart issues. And, and the reality of it is, it's not really good for anybody to have uh, too much salt in their body. But Job, way back in Job chapter 6, verse 6, says, Can, can something tasteless be eaten without salt? Now, just between you and I, uh, we don't eat french fries, do we? Are french fries worth anything if they don't have some salt on it? Or or potato chips, some of the snack food, pretzels? The salt is what enhances the flavor. And so with that, the Apostle Paul uses that to drive an important point across. He says in Colossians chapter 4, verse 6, let your speech always be with grace. And get this, as though seasoned with salt, that you will know how you should respond to each person. Do we get that? Seasoned with salt. In another place, in Ephesians chapter 4, Verses 25 and verse 29. Let's read these two verses. Ephesians 4, 25 and 29. Paul said, Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, to his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Let no unwholesome word Proceed from your mouth, 
but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment so that it will give grace to those who hear. Now, I think that dovetails off Colossians 4, 6. It says, let your, see your speech always be with grace, though seasoned with salt. And he says literally in Ephesians 4, 25 and 29, the same thing. He just doesn't um, overload us with salt. <laughs> Maybe he's telling us we shouldn't eat too much salt. All right. Uh, we've almost come to the end of our lesson. And uh, maybe you have heard the expression. I, I don't know if it's a, I, I think it's a very, very old term. So maybe if you're very young, you haven't heard it before. But there is a, an expression out there. When, when someone is worthy, they say, that person is worth his salt. Huh. Now, how in the world did that come about? That someone is worth their salt? Well, the saying came out because in ancient times, very often, the workers were paid in salt because it was a precious commodity. As a matter of fact, here we go. We're going to get into a, a little word entomology. Our word salary, all of us know what it means to get a salary for our work, comes from the Latin word salarium, S-A-L-A-R-I-U-M. And the root word of that is salt. It goes way back into the ancient days when very often people were paid in salt. And if salt were scarce, was scarce, people would uh, literally almost panic because it was so important. It was so scarce that there were times that people would give an ounce of salt for an ounce of gold. Can we think of that today? No, no, that's very, very far because salt is much more common to us. But when salt got uncommon, when there wasn't enough of it, people would give an ounce of gold for an ounce of salt. And so with that, as we complete our lesson, if we are Christians, how valuable are we to the world? Remember, if we go back to Matthew 13, Jesus said, we are to be the salt and the light of the world. We're to be the salt of the earth. And the powerful implication here is that if we are the salt of the earth, we are valuable. We are valuable to those around us because of all those things I mentioned. Salt declares loyalty, it declares sacrifice, and it reminds us of what is essential to life. Not to mention that it makes some things actually more flavorful. Let's live our lives as Christians to show we're just as valuable as gold. And people can actually say, that person is worth his salt because they won't say he's worth his gold, but they will say that he's worth his salt. Why? Because Jesus said so. Jesus said that his people are to be the salt of the earth. And we know in another place, he said, if salt has lost its flavor, if it has lost those purative devices, uh, uh, qualities that it has, it's no good anymore. You might as well throw it away. Salt was valuable. 
And the metaphor here is such that we understand that we are to be the salt of the earth. Jesus expects us. The world needs salt's saving power. When Jesus said in Matthew 28 and Mark 16, go out into all the world, preaching them the gospel, preaching the gospel to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. When he said that, he said that to you and I, and you know what he said? You'll do that because you're the salt of the earth. <laughs> you're, you're that vital component to the earth. Therefore, I give you the ability to go out and spread the word of God because you are the salt of the earth just as you are the light of the world and so for a moment let's examine our lives and see if we justify these lessons that Jesus talked to us about that we are the salt of the earth that when people say we're worth our salt that that's a compliment that we're worth something take it back to our Christian roots all the way back to the Jewish roots where salt was used to seal covenants. And that when we were baptized, we made a covenant to the Lord, just as the people of the Old Testament sealed their covenants with salt. And we can see that metaphor rising. And just as Jesus spoke in many ways uh, to get his points across, I think this is one of the most powerful ones. Let's be worth our salt. If you're not a child of God, if you haven't come in, come into that covenant relationship with God, we offer you that invitation this evening. When we confess that Jesus is the Son of God, when we repent of our former ways, and when we are baptized for the remission of our sins, we tell God, I want to be the salt of the earth. I want to be what you declared that we are supposed to be. If you haven't fulfilled that obligation to the Lord and you're not one of his children, we offer you that invitation. If you need to come to the Lord, get in touch with one of us and we will be in touch with you to help you to make that commitment to the Lord. Let's close our service with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. Help us to understand this very, very simple lesson about what the Lord expects us to be, to indeed be the salt and the light of the world. Help us to be all that uh, Jesus expected us to be. And here on earth, as we are implored to spread the word, that will spread the word in such a way that people will know that we are worth our salt, that we are Christians, and that that is the most important thing to us. Bless us in our Christian walk. Help us to, to love and encourage one another. Help us so that when our day is over, that we will reside with you forever in heaven. Be with all those on our prayer list and our bulletin, dear Heavenly Father. Be with them and, and help them to understand that our prayers are being sent on their behalf. Bless us and be with us. I pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please all of you be safe and may God bless you all.